uh, this is now at an area dy, distance d, or yes, on this side dy at a distance dx over 2. I can do that again for these other two forces. I am not going to write everything down in class just for the sake of saving time, but I have everything in the notes that I'll scan and post online. Also, I posted, for those of you who haven't been checking Canvas, I posted the first two lectures on the Canvas site, uh, and I'll, I didn't post these ones yet because they were kind of between each other, so I'll post these probably at the end of today. The, then, so, we'll get the more stuff, we'll do some arithmetic, and then we end up at our, at the, the probably new, which is sigma xy is equal to sigma yx. But this is sort of how you go through that derivation. And again, I'm just, I'm just sort of skipping out on this to save time. Uh, we have another plus some stuff, and another minus some stuff, based on a, a counterclockwise sum of the moments. Um, so now, that, now we know our, our stress tensor here do, 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 is symmetric which makes life a lot easier. It turns out symmetric matrices mathematically are a lot easier to deal with. So now our sigma x, y is our sigma equal, these two are equal, and these two are equal. And so uh, we can now sort of simplify our, our stress tensor to, a, to an upper right diagonal matrix. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. What else do we know about the stress in the system? So we know that the shear stress in one direction and the other has to be the same, which is also why, in general, if you ever see anyone draw stress, they draw it, or draw shear stress, they draw it like this, because it has to be balanced in those two directions. Um, what else do we know about the system? Well, we know it can't be moving in any given direction. So here we have our F equals MA. We know that the, the sum of forces in any given direction has to be equal to zero for it not to move. So what can we do with that? So I have now a second one is a force equilibrium. Da, da, da. So I know the, the sum of force has to be equal to zero. So now I'm going to draw a unit cube. Do, do, do. Cube. This is our x, y, z. I have this now as a width dx, dy, uh, no, dz, and dy here, the length of these cubes. So this is again a linearized uh, unit cube. Uh, acting on this body, I'm only going to consider the x direction right now, but this analysis kind of generally applies for all the other directions. Our origin now doo -doo -doo -doo, is at the back, so it just happens to be easier to define this way. In this direction we have a sigma xx, in this direction we have a sigma xx plus the, remember the stress is changing in the body, d sigma xx uh, dx times a unit dx. Here now we have a shear acting on the top in the x direction and on the bottom and a shear acting on the friction and on the back face in the x direction. Here on the top this is a sigma xy plus d sigma xy dy times that distance from the origin. Here, this is a sigma xy. Here, this is a sigma xz plus d sigma xz dz times that distance in that direction. And then here in the back, oh, I apologize for this being so messy feels like this is all over the place. Uh, sigma x. So now, again, I can take a sum of the forces. When I take the sum of the forces, forces stress times area, 
Now I have the stress on each of these faces, sum of the forces in the x direction. I can take on one side, I have a sigma xx plus xx dx. This is my stress, and then it's on this side, this side face. So this is a dy dz. Then in my opposite direction, this should be a sigma xx. Did I have that as a y? Did I say y then? Uh, should be x. I have a sigma xx, which is my stress. Now again, times dy dz. You can do the same for each of these. So you have another plus some stuff, minus some stuff, plus some stuff, minus some stuff. Apply the that shear in this direction times the face. The, the shear in this direction times the face area, uh, and so on for each of those. And eventually what you end up, it, end up with, we know that this all has to be equal to zero. We do some more arithmetic up at the partial derivative of sigma xx dx plus partial derivative of sigma xy dy partial sigma xz dz has to be equal to zero. So now a condition for our body to be fixed in time. We can make this more general and say, uh, well, I can write it also as the sum of d sigma dx i from i equals one to three where x1 is x, x2 is y, x3 is z, just as a convenient notation mechanism. So this is a nice sum. I can make this more general by game analysis in every direction, and I can say now d sigma um, i, i j d x j, the sum of those bodies over j is one to three, has to be equal to zero as a very general stress equilibrium. For the most part, this probably won't be super useful on a day-to-day -day engineering basis, but if you start taking more advanced mechanics classes, this is kind of one of the, the foundations of, of some of your mechanics theories, and you'll, you'll kind of go out of things. Uh, da, da, da. All right, so now we know that our stress has to be symmetric, so we know that the shear in the xy direction has to be equal to the shear in the sh sigma xy has to be equal to sigma yx, and same for every other direction, and the divergence, the sum of the, the derivatives of this in every direction has to be zero, or in a given direction has to be zero. So what else can we do with stress? What else is important to know about this? So now we have options for how stress exists. Let's look at <coughs> stress transformations, which you should also probably be somewhat familiar with. Hopefully this is like mostly review slash refreshing, possibly. Am I, am I totally losing people with this? This is all fine. It's all okay? All right. Okay. Uh, cool. So now let's look into stress stress transformations. So again, all, all of these I'm kind of lumping together because these are all independent of the constitutive laws. This is all just a property of, of stress. So you can do this without actually knowing that that stress is linear elastic in, in a small strain is E epsilon, and without knowing any plasticity theory, without any of this, these are all true in general if you have a stress tensor. So for stress transformations, doot, 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 let's take this as an example. I have some dog bone specimen or tensile test specimen that I am pulling with a load P, uh, A, and I'm going to define a coordinate system now as an x and a y direction. This looks like an x 
this is y. Um, so now I know the stress in the x direction here is zero, stress in the y direction is p over a, stress y is zero, so there's no shear. If instead I took that and I defined my coordinate system differently, so I took the same thing, do, 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 still a p, still an area a, do, do, do. Now I define my coordinate system as an xy coordinate system here. All of a sudden my sigma x is p over a, sigma y is zero, sigma xy is zero. So that probably makes sense. Um, but what happens if I then have some coordinate, some arbitrary direction, x prime, y prime, rotated by some angle theta? So why, why would I actually care what the stress in this orientation is? Why might it be interesting to look at, look at how, look at what stress is in different orientation angles? Yeah, that's a good one. Do you have? I was gonna say a similar thing. Like you might want to look; it's gonna fail in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, exactly those. So the the failure of a material is often dependent on the stress state. So, plasticity in metals, for example, if you remember our friendly dislocation in our metal, that dislocation will move only under an applied shear strain. So if you shear it, that distance can then slide. But if you apply a hydrostatic pressure or uniaxial stress in either direction, it doesn't really have any way to move around. If I have a crack in a material, which often occurs at something like a welded joint, um, or if I have a weld which then just has, I don't know, just a weak plane in its own, and I apply a stress in that, and I'll get a crack to be able to move. But it's, it's weakest plane, it's, it's most likely to open here in this direction perpendicular to the crack. If instead I had a stress in this direction, then I would need to know the resolved stress along this direction, or along this direction, to figure out what the force on that crack is. And you have a couple different frac modes on that, on that, that may start interacting, which we'll talk about later in the quarter when we start getting into stress concentrations and fracture mechanics. Um, but yeah, so, so it's generally important to know not just that a, a stress is acting on a body, but specifically the type of load and which direction it's acting in, because often failure is directionally dependent. So if I now want to figure out what the stress is in some arbitrary orientation, there's, there's a few different ways that I can do it. One nice graphic way, a nice uh, a way that I can visualize it is with a stress triangle. Triangle. But if I have some body with stress acting in the sigma y, y, x, some shear, x, sigma, x, y some force acting here, sigma x, some shear acting here, sigma x, y. And I take that body and I cut it open. So if this originally started as a square, uh, and I cut that open, and I now want to look at the stress in this coordinate sum. So now if this is my x prime, doo -doo -doo, and this is my y prime, I'm gonna have some angle theta here. I want to know what the stress sigma x prime and tau xy or sigma xy x prime y prime. I want to know what these two quantities are. So I can actually do this here with this little stress triangle as a force balance. So I can say now if I define say this area to be area 
equals area A. If I define this side, this side would then be A cosine, or A sine, A sine theta. This side is now an A cosine theta. I can say the sum of forces in the x prime direction has to be equal to zero, which is then, oh, all right. So in the x prime direction, there's, there's a sigma x prime a acting in these two directions and in there's there's a contribution from both the the axial and the shear forces acting here so i have minus sigma x times cosine theta which is this in the direction and then times a cosine theta, which is in the area. I can then say this is also minus sigma y sine theta, da, 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 sine theta, a sine theta, there's a sine theta in there, uh, minus, I have a tau x, sigma xy, sigma xy, a cosine theta, sine theta minus sigma xy a sine theta cosine theta. I can do a similar thing for the sum of forces in the y and then I can do lots of algebra that I'm not going to show. I don't have the algebra in the notes either but I at least have all of the force balances written out in the different directions uh, and what you end up with is, oh, I should do this on another piece of paper. Just burning through trees today. Um, what you end up with after that force balance is you get some sigma x prime is equal to this big, long, ugly equation. Sigma x sine squared of theta plus sigma y sine squared theta uh, 2 sigma xy sine theta cosine theta here's sigma y prime is equal to sine squared of theta sigma y cosine squared of theta minus 2 sigma xy sine cosine sigma x prime y prime is now sigma x y cosine squared of theta minus sine squared theta Oof. sigma y minus sigma x sine sine theta cosine theta Okay, so if you went through that force balance, if you looked at, if you drew all the algebra, eventually you would pop something like this out. Hopefully this, <laughs> you should pop this out, not something like this. Um, we can also define some, so there's some cosine squareds and some sine theta, cosine thetas in there. We can plug some trig relationships in and write this in a different form. So. Uh, da, da, da. I can also say that this is one half sigma x sigma y one half sigma x minus sigma y cosine two theta plus uh, geez sigma x y sine of two theta oh. Sorry, this is getting kind of small for people in the back. Um, anyway, so I have I have these written out. The, uh, I'm going to write this one down. Sigma xy cosine 2 theta do, 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 minus sigma xy or two, minus sigma y minus sorry so theta uh, and this is something similar. I'm going to define this as my equation one 
and as equation two mm -hmm. for now, and I'll come back to those in a minute. So this is some stress transformation. These two forms end up being useful in a second when I talk something that you should also be familiar with, which is more circle. Uh, another way to get about this, to get through stress transformations that maybe depending on how much you like linear algebra, uh, if I have some direction y, x, x prime, y prime, there's a and angle theta, I can define a rotation matrix R, which in two dimensions is cosine theta, sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. And I can then say, I can use rotation matrix to, to have a change of basis, which if you're familiar with linear algebra should sound familiar. If you're not as familiar with linear algebra, or if you hate linear algebra, then maybe not. But if I go through and then say, now sigma prime, uh, this is a, a 2D rotation matrix. There's a similar one for 3D, but this equation holds for both of them, R transpose sigma R. If I went through and multiplied this out, I would end up back at this same relationship with some cosines and sines, or ideally you would. Um, and I think I have some um, detail on that in the notes, but not a lot. If you want to do it as an exercise for yourself, you're more than welcome to, but I figured I wouldn't torment you with more math stuff. Uh, okay, so stress transformations. This is a nice mathematical way to look at these things. So you have these, these big long equations uh, that look at stress in different coordinates. There's a nice pictorial way of representing this, which is known as Moore's circle, which I think you should also all be familiar with. You should have learned it before. All right. So for Moore's circle now, Moore's circle, I'm going to take my equation one and my equation two. You do some rearranging on those, you square some stuff, and that equation one ends up as two, 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 sigma minus sigma y over 2, two, two, two that's equal to sigma x minus sigma y 2 squared squared cosine 2 theta plus, ah, oh jeez, plus sigma x y squared sine squared theta Sine tau squared something similar sigma x minus sigma y two, two, two squared sine two theta ah oh, crap cosine squared of two theta sine squared of of two theta plus sigma x y squared cosine squared of minus sigma x minus sigma y if I add equation 1 plus equation 2 then this goes to a nice form that we can work with that you should all hopefully be familiar with uh, which is sigma oh so here, for more circle, right, I'm defining, here I'm saying sigma is equal to my sigma x prime, and my tau is equal to my sigma x prime y prime, just for the sake of convenience in writing these things out. Do, 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 sigma x sigma y over 2 squared plus tau squared equal to x minus sigma y 
to y. So, after lots and lots of algebra, lots and lots of chugging numbers around, lots of moving things around, um, you end up at this formula, which is, for those who maybe recognize it, this is our formula, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So this is the formula of a circle, very conveniently. That formula of a circle, we can then take uh, and draw as something known as Moore's circle. Do, do, do. So on my x and y axis, axes, instead, I'll have a, a stress and a, and a axial and shear stress. I'll be able to draw some sort of circle here. This, I promise, is circular. I have some center, some radius. I can say now the center of my circle, which is also equal to my mean stress. is equal to sigma x plus sigma y over 2. My radius now is equal to square root of sigma x minus sigma y over 2 x y squared squared. And so what's really the most useful about the Mohr circle is what you can very quickly pull out of it, which is what's known as your principal stresses. So the stress here, sigma one, and the stress here, sigma two. Also, here we have some angle to theta. So your principal stresses are, if you apply some state of load to any body, there's some direction that you can rotate it in where there's no shear on the body, where you have pure hydrostatic forces acting. Um, and that those stresses are known as your principal stresses. So mathematically you can do that, uh, which you may or may not have done in classes before. The, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of your stress tensor are your principal stresses and principal stress directions. Does that sound familiar? Yes? Okay, so you've done some eigenvector, eigen analysis on stress tensors before to find principal stresses? No? No? Okay. But you've seen more circle before? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, how many of you know eigenvectors and eigenvalues from linear algebra? Most people, to a little bit. Okay. So, So here from Moore's circle, you can very quickly pull out what the maximum stresses are. You can take, so sigma 1 would then enter plus r. Sigma 2 is your center minus r. Um, and so you can, for a 2D stress state, you can pretty easily figure out what, what those principal stresses are. The more mathematical way to do it, and probably the easier way when you get into three dimensions, there's a three-dimensional version of Moore's circle, which I don't really want to write down because uh, it's a little bit tedious uh, and the equations for it are much more complicated. Uh, the proper way to do it, if I have some stress, I have uh, my principal stresses equal eigenvalues principal stress directions equal again vectors. So if you go to take a more advanced solid mechanics class, this is probably the analysis you would use to actually get these. And if you're ever using a computer, something like MATLAB, there's functions built in where you can say eig and find the eigenvalues of a matrix and find the eigenvalue values of a matrix and eigenvectors of a matrix, pop them out. So if you ever, like, when you're actually working in industry, that's probably actually the easiest way to do it, rather than trying to remember these equations, which should, you should end up at the same answer. 
if you do everything correctly. Uh, this is a nice, a, a little bit nicer way to do it, to go about it. Okay, um, so I'll talk really quickly about the lab in the next couple minutes. Let's pull up. This. Okay, so just as a reminder, this is a, a lab write up. So you're required to do the, the data and now basically the results and discussion section of the report. There's the lab grading rubric on, online, and I think in lab, Serwin will talk to you about uh, what he's expecting for you guys to do in that, in that regard, uh, because he will be the one grading today. Um, and then on next Friday, he'll give a recitation for analyzing some of these quantities because it can be a little bit tricky. To, so here in the manual, uh, there's kind of a general overview. This sort of a, so this isn't a, a formal lab report. This sort of a layout is kind of a, a guide for you as to how to write a more form, formal report, how things should be formatted for next, next week, the next, next, when we do the torsion lab will actually give you a template, an outline of a lab report with some kind of write this here, write some details about this here so you know sort of what we're expecting. But this also is intended to serve as a guide for you to go off of when writing a report, kind of how it should be laid out, how, uh, what sort of language should be used, the sorts of figures, all of that. So all the need to do the analysis are in here and some examples. Uh, it'll be a tensile test on four different materials, two metals, an aluminum and a steel, and two polymers, uh, an acrylic and a, and a polycarbonate, polycarbonate. Um, and you'll see sort of the differences between those. In, uh, in the discussion and analysis, I have sort of a list of things that you guys should be looking for, two to two, a big long list of things, and some things that you should be considering when you're doing your discussion and analysis, which is in this section. Uh, I wanted to really quickly go through a couple statistics things that you should keep in mind when doing this. So most of the data, do, 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 most of, uh, will be a little bit noisy. Uh, there's, there'll be some scatter. You'll get, you'll be getting stress strain, uh, yield strength, ultimate strength, fracture strength. Uh, those values will all have some variance to them. They'll be kind of a little bit all over the map. So part of your discussion, you should be discussing why there is that variance and, and quantifying that variance. And you do through do so through some statistics. Uh, as a real quick reminder, so some ones that are useful, the mean uh, x is the sum from i to n of all of your x n, x i, over n's, the standard deviation standard deviation, uh, I have an s square root of the sum from i to n of xi minus the mean squared over n minus n. So this is your standard deviation. One other that you, so both of these you should probably know, one other that's maybe not as familiar is the is a linear regression or a, a coefficient of determination, which you use for, for a linear regression. So coefficient of determination. This is also known as an R squared value, which some of you may have seen before. So if I have some data set like that, and I want to fit a line to it, I'm going to have that fit be some function f of my data x. Here my coefficient of is equal to uh, sum of squares. So I have a, a sum of squares that I'm going to define as ss total is equal to sum from i equals 1 to n of i minus x bar squared, which this quantity is basically that one in the standard deviation. Then my residual sum of squares, which I have as ss 
residual. Here, this is the difference i equals 1 to n, xi minus fi squared, where here this fi is your fit. So if this fit is perfect, then this would be 0. So if, if every one of these points at every along the length lands on this, then, then this residual sum of squares should be 0. Your r squared now is 1 minus the total, or the residual, sorry, the residual over the total. So this one would, will be useful, particularly in finding the um, These three, I think, are the main ones that you should be thinking about. There's also error propagation. So when you take a measurement, there's some deviation. So I say, I say the width of something is maybe 10 plus or minus 0 0.1 millimeter for your, for your sample. This error, this one, this 1% error then propagates through your, through your results. So if I have a 1% error here, my next measurement also has that same 1% error. And if I say, then now my area is my, uh, let's say like one half, uh, uh, let's say this is just a width times a, a length, then this has the same, same percent error. So the errors are propagating through in your data analysis, and in the discussion section, you're discussing how those errors are affecting your analysis. So when you have that standard deviation, that error analysis could potentially explain why there's that deviation.